Thank you, everybody, for coming to the Aaron Torres Podcast YouTube page. If you could do me a quick favor, see that little black subscribe button at the bottom of your screen? Go ahead, click that black subscribe button. Really does help our audience grow. Really does help our channel grow. Really does help and mean more than you could possibly know. So go ahead, hit that little black subscribe button. Also, thank you to our presenting sponsor, Betfred Sportsbook and the Betfred Sportsbook app. Bet 50 on any game. Get 250 in free bets. Thank you again to Betfred. Thank you again to you. Now, here is the video that you came here for. Wednesday, May 31st. So it is coming up here quick. And so what I want to do, I want to open the show by talking about the biggest stay or go decisions that remain. In other words, if you plan on returning to college basketball, you have to withdraw from the NBA draft by midnight tomorrow. And there are still a ton of really big players that have not made their decisions. Now, there's a few that have. We'll talk about them at the back end of this segment, but I want to focus on the guys that are still testing the NBA draft waters, the guys that could, in theory, come back, the guys that could have a major impact on college basketball. Before we get to all the big names, just two quick caveats. One, workouts keep going. Uh, They happen all weekend. They will happen today. They will happen tomorrow on Wednesday. So a lot of guys are really probably going to wait until Wednesday to actually withdraw their names from the draft. And then beyond that, uh, this is a very fluid topic, right? So if you're listening Tuesday morning as opposed to Tuesday afternoon, there may be a few names that have already withdrawn from the draft. So don't yell at me. Don't tweet at me. Torres, you said this guy's still testing and he's out. Listen, this stuff changes. As I'm recording, I promise you all of these guys have not made their decision but some of them will. Let's get to the biggest decisions that remain. And I don't think there is going to be a bigger program that is going to be more impacted over the next few days than the Kentucky Wildcats. And I'll take it a step further. This might sound like hyperbole. It might sound like Torres is just doing the thing where he exaggerates everything. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say these are some of the 48 most important hours of the John Calipari era. I'm not saying they're the most important, but when you think about what has happened at Kentucky the last three years, right? Missed the NCAA tournament in 2021. 2022, you lose as a two seed to a 15 seed. 2023, you lose in the second round. So we're now talking about an eight-year stretch with no Final Four. We're talking about, what, a five-year stretch? We're going on 2019 since the last time they even made the second weekend of the NCAA tournament. And I get 2020, they had a team that was good enough to win it with Tyrese Maxey and Emmanuel Quickly. But I bring it up, it's a drought at Kentucky. And the team right now, as I record this second that they have, it ain't looking very good for 2023. Listen, I've gone over this time and time again. But right now, as I record, and things will can and will change, Kentucky has seven scholarship players ready for 2023 okay we have schools that are filled to the capacity that have 13 scholarship players that have 12 that have 11 Kentucky needs three more guys just to run five on five scrimmages take it a step further of the seven that are coming back five are true freshmen you have a redshirt freshman in Ugana Onyenso who barely played I believe he appeared in one SEC game last year and you have a do Fierro who listen I like him he's fine He's probably a year away from being a major, major contributor on this team. And so you look at Kentucky. They have missed on everybody in the portal they've gone after, and I've talked about that, and I've criticized the program, and I thought they moved too slow. But right now the focus has to be on three players that are currently testing the NBA draft waters, and the scary part is I don't think any of them are a guarantee to return. The three players, Oscar Shibway, former All-American National Player of the Year, Antonio Reeves, a sharpshooter who really came on strong late, most notably 37 points in the uh, SEC season finale at Arkansas, and Chris Livingston, kind of a a projected guy and a project guy and all that. So right now, Kentucky has seven guys. Three guys are testing. Here's the scary part. None of them right now are like a lock to come back. Like There are some guys that are just going to take this to the end, see what's out there, and come back. There is no guarantee that any of them are coming back. And there's actually increasing buzz that Antonio Reeves, a player who many believed was, he's just going to test and he'll eventually be back, that he could actually be hitting the portal as a graduate transfer. Now, the positive news, I would say that over the last two, three weeks, it has become increasingly more likely 
that Oscar Sheepway does return. And again, we're going to figure this out over the coming days, coming hours, really. But I, at this point, I think you kind of need Oscar Sheepway back, right? Like you are not going to find somebody in the portal who a, a few things. One, you can't find anybody in the portal that's going to get you 13, 14 boards a game. But two, that knows the program, that knows John Calipari, that knows the idiosyncrasies of what he does and how he runs that program. And he also just needs some veterans in that locker room that have been there and been through it. So the good news is it's increasingly looking like you're going to get back Oscar Sheepway. I still think that Antonio Reeves can be talked into returning because you go into the portal and I get it. It's exciting. There's new ideas, new options. Everybody's going to promise you the world. But you were just at Kentucky on the biggest stage in college basketball and were really a breakout guy over the last probably six weeks of the season. Convince him to come back. Now you have a veteran, a shooter. Yes, I get that there are other young guards on that roster, but you can't tell me there aren't a lot of minutes to be had for Antonio Reeves. So my hunch is that he comes back. Um, and then finally, Chris Livingston. I don't think it's going to happen. I guess the only positive to that is that Chris Livingston has not yet officially announced that he's staying in, although even his statement when he announced he was declaring did not seem as though he's coming back. I don't think he's coming back. We can argue whether he should, whether he shouldn't. I see the tools that have NBA people excited, but he's another guy that feels like a year away. But you talk about what's going on at Kentucky, and I'm sure after the deadline, one way or another, we'll be talking about them. But a program that needs some good news right now, my hunch, and I'll be honest, my hope is that Oscar Shibway and Antonio Reeves come back because you really just need some bodies at this point and obviously some quality bodies. Still think they have work to do in the portal, by the way. But it starts with this draft deadline, and man, oh man, oh man. We went from probably not wanting Oscar at all back to now it's like you kind of need him going forward. Let's get to some of the other teams that have some big, big weeks ahead outside of Kentucky. I think you would probably argue the second team with the second most at stake is actually the Creighton Blue Jays. Okay, So for people who don't really know Creighton very well or whatever, Creighton was a program, came into this year in the top 10, dealt with all sorts of injuries. Ryan Kalkbrenner, a player we'll talk about in a minute, had mono, struggled early, started in the top 10, then struggled, then got hot late. And remember, they ended the season in the Elite Eight against the San Diego State Aztecs. So lost in the Elite Eight to the national runners-up. So you can sit here and say it was a disappointing season. They ended in the Elite Eight. Now, they've had an interesting offseason because two of their starters have actually entered the transfer portal. Ryan Nemhard is gone. And Arthur Kaluma is testing the waters, but if he comes back, I don't believe Creighton is a real option. More importantly for this conversation, though, Creighton has two players that are currently testing right now that are really important to their 2023-2024 prospectus. That's Ryan Kalkbrenner, all Big East center, and Trey Alexander, a really, really good guard. Ryan Kalkbrenner, for people who don't know, seven-footer. I think he's one of the most dominant players in the college basketball in terms of the defensive end of the floor, two blocks per game this year, 16 points, six rebounds, just a really, really, really elite player and a player that obviously it goes without saying you can't replace at this point, right? Um, they have a nice backup center named Frederick King, but he's not going to be a 16, six and two guy next year. So if you lose Ryan Kalkbrenner, you have a gaping hole in the front court. And it's kind of the same with Trey Alexander, the guard from Creighton, you lose him. I don't think you can easily replace 13 points per game and 42% three-point shooting. And the thing about Trey Alexander as well is it goes without saying is that if you follow this team, he's a guy that in a, in a pinch, he can play the point. So you talk about a versatile guard that can play on the ball, that can play off the ball, a 41, 42% three-point shooter. Creighton gets both those guys back. I think we're talking about a preseason top 10 team that's good enough again to win the Big East. If they don't get him back, then my hunch is that Creighton, probably a fringe top 25 team at that. A couple of nice players coming back. Baylor Shireman will be a fifth-year guy at this point. Um, a couple of nice transfers, Steve Ashworth from Utah State. But Creighton really needs those two back. Again, this is all changing by the moment. My hunch is that both come back, though. Other teams, outside of Creighton, outside of Kentucky, no individual player outside of maybe Oscar Shibwe is more important to his 2023-2024 team. 
than the reigning national player of the year, Zach Eady. And first of all, I'll say this. It's interesting to think about the impact that NIL has had. Last year, Oscar Shibwe comes back as the reigning national player of the year. This year, we can get Zach Eady back at Purdue. But I'll be blunt. I don't think it's a guarantee at this point. And this is an interesting conversation that is worth having is that, and we talked about this after the NBA combine, but I'll be blunt. When I saw Zach Eady put his name in the NBA draft back in whatever, mid to early April, I really thought he was a guy that, to, I, I thought he was a guy that was going to go through the waters, test, come back, maybe not come back. Is he going to come back? But he'd probably just end up coming back, right? Go get feedback, this and that. But two things have happened. One, he went to the combine and, and I think there's real interest in drafting him. It was interesting. I, I heard this stat. I think it was Jonathan Cavoni from ESPN put this out. Zach Eady measured at seven foot four uh, with some crazy wingspan, like an almost an eight foot wingspan. And those measurables, if he was in the NBA or when he's in the NBA, if he was in the NBA next year, would be the second, he'd be the second tallest player with the second biggest wingspan in the NBA behind only Victor Wenbanyama. So you talk about, you know, the impact of size and length and all that. But like I said, when he started this process, I thought, okay, he's just going to test and get feedback and this and that. Now it's looking more and more like he could be back. Now, I'm not sold that he is definitively leaving. And there are a few signs that kind of make it indicate to me that he's probably coming back. One, Purdue has scheduled the game in his home city of Toronto next year against Alabama. Could mean nothing. But it does feel like kind of a nice way to reward a player who's a, a you know, a, he will be a program icon if he comes back. He already is, but he would probably have his jersey retired at that point. So a nice way to kind of honor him playing in Toronto kind of feels weird if you know he's not coming back. Um, I've seen different stuff. You know, Tom Izzo made a speech at one point and he was kind of talking about the 2023-2024 Big Ten and said, oh yeah, Purdue's got everybody coming back. So that's interesting. And then there's just the draft prospects of it. My understanding is Purdue has really ramped up their NIL as well because Zach Eady is an international student. It's a little complicated. Maybe they fell a little bit behind, but no different than Kentucky with Oscar Shibwe. UConn with Adama Sanogo. With these international players, you have to figure out a way to get these guys paid um, because they're deserving. And right, that's what NIL is supposed to be about. You're supposed to be rewarding the guys that have used their name, image, likeness to propel your team and your school. Zach Eady, you can agree or disagree on Purdue, on this, on that. That dude is deserving of a lot of cold, hard cash in college basketball. A few other schools worth keeping an eye on. <clears throat> Excuse me. One, Illinois. I, I, Illinois is an interesting one. I don't think I talked about them after the NBA draft combine, but they had two players. Remember, Illinois NCAA tournament team lost to Arkansas in round one. Illinois, um, two their two best players are both testing, and I think it's a real possibility that they could lose both. Coleman Hawkins, who's kind of a glue guy, do it all about almost 10 points per game, six rebounds, a couple steals, elite defensive player. Really, again, I, I know I just used the term, but when you talk about a glue guy, a guy that can have so much impact on both ends of the floor, there aren't many better in college basketball. Six foot 10 can really guard about two through five on the floor. Then you have your leading returning scorer, Terrence Shannon Jr., TJ Shannon, 17 points per game last year. Both guys are testing. Now, I think the assumption has always been that Terrence Shannon was kind of a one-year guy at Illinois. Maybe he comes back. I know their NIL setup is pretty good at Illinois. Maybe he comes back. Maybe he doesn't. But Coleman Hawkins is the one. You lose both those guys. That's starting to look like a fringe NCAA tournament, probably bubble team. I know Illinois is kind of in the mix for some transfers, but they haven't had those crazy impact transfer commitments this offseason. A couple nice players, a couple role players, but you really kind of need those two guys back to have an NCAA tournament caliber team. Illinois is one to watch going forward. A couple others before we get out of here, switch gears. Um, one is UConn. Listen, I, I've talked about UConn a ton this offseason reigning national champs, my school, my alma mater, whatever. I bring it up. They have really four guys off of the national championship team that have gone through the process. Two of them are in and not coming back. Adama Sonogo, the NCAA tournament, Final Four most outstanding player, and Jordan Hawkins, who is going to be a lottery pick out of the backcourt. Where it gets interesting, there's two others, Andre Jackson, 6'8", 6'9", forward, and guard Tristan Newton. 
Now I'll be blunt. When Andre Jackson entered this draft, it really felt like even he was kind of saying, yeah, I'm going to test the waters. We're going to see whatever, but he has tested through the roof. He's an elite, elite, elite athlete. Um, intangibles guy and 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 he's now playing himself into the first round and I'm not surprised by it. I think throughout his college career everyone has focused on what he can't do, which is basically hit the three-point shot. What's funny is of course if he could hit a three-point shot he would have been a one and done and been in the league 2 years ago cuz he has that kind of elite athleticism and his in intangibles. But as time goes on what I a lot of people NBA people are starting to realize is we need role play. like everybody wants to be a star this league, you need role players. You need great role players. Think about all the great role players in these NBA playoffs. And that's what he was at UConn, and that's what he's comfortable being. So you're not drafting a guy who can't, who's coming in average 19 points per game having to figure out, is he going to buy into a role? Is he going to do what we ask? No, he's been doing that for three years at UConn. Play, has played himself into the first round conversation. I suspect he will be gone. And I think UConn has kind of prepared for it. There's no real way to replace them, but I think they kind of understand, listen, this is an opportunity. His stock is never going to be higher. There's no reason at this point to wait. Uh, so you have Andre Jackson, Tristan Newton is the other guy, player that came on really strong, had a great NCAA tournament. Interesting story on him. He was one of these fourth-year guys that came in as a transfer a year ago. Most people thought he was kind of a, a quote-unquote one-and-done as a senior at UConn, he was going to kind of plug a hole and play in a key role, but he's got that COVID here. And right now it feels like he's probably going to come back still really like UConn, even without Andre Jackson, but they would obviously fall a little bit. And then the last team that I think is really interesting. And it's just mostly from a scholarship perspective is the Arkansas Razorbacks. Arkansas has two players currently testing Jordan Walsh and Devo Davis, Jordan Walsh. My hunch is that he's gone. Devo Davis, I don't know what he's going to do because you have a loaded backcourt at Arkansas. If you come back, he would pl play, but how much, what would his role be? Whatever. Uh, my guess is Devo Davis comes back, but why it's also interesting is just from a scholarship perspective, right? Arkansas is still in the mix for Ron Holland, the five-star player who is decommitted from Texas. And they're still in the mix for a bunch of transfers, most notably Grant Nelson from North Dakota state. And so it'll be interesting to follow. It'll be interesting to see. My guess is Jordan Walsh is for sure gone. Devo Davis, I, I don't think anybody even knows at this point as he continues to go through the process. A um, couple other things. One, we have had a few players announce their decisions, and there is some impact on that with college basketball. On a positive note, Kansas got back a wing named Kevin McCuller. Kevin McCuller, nice two-way player. 10 points per game, six rebounds. He's a big guard, really elite defender. And so you're now bringing back another player off last year's team that was the number one seed, the Big 12 regular season champion. And that's just another really, really, really nice piece for Bill Self as you look at his 2023-2024 roster. Yes, it's all about Hunter Dickinson, but like I said, kind of with UConn, with Kentucky, with whoever, with Purdue, you want players who have been there. You want players who know the system. So even though it's going to be about the off season that Bill Self had, bring in a bunch of transfers, including Hunter Dickinson, the truth is, um, I don't want to say Kevin McCuller is as impactful as Hunter Dickinson, but probably the second biggest win of Bill Self's off season was getting Kevin McCuller back. Now, if you guys have left that are noteworthy as well, one Omax Prosper from Marquette. We talked about him last time. Marquette, remember, was the Big East regular season champ, was the Big East tournament champ. They were, I think, a two or a three seed in the NCAA tournament. And they were projected to return literally everybody off that team. Well, they lose Omax Prosper, kind of a, a, a back, you know, a two-way guard, plays both ends of the, uh, back, uh, forward, excuse me, plays both ends of the court. Um, he is a guy that I don't think was even on draft boards going into this process, has now played himself, I believe, into the first round. He'll go somewhere in the 20s. And he's that prototypical guy that every NBA team is looking for. Size, athleticism, defensive prowess, all that good stuff. I don't think this impacts Marquette as much as you think, though. They had a great 7-8 man rotation. There are other guys on the roster that I think are going to step up. I'm still going to have Marquette as a top 10 team going into next year, even without Omax Prosper. The one that hurts, though, the one that hurts Alabama lost their starting center, Charles Bediaco, and that was one I don't think anybody really thought was going to happen. 
knew you're going to lose Brandon Miller, knew you were going to lose Noah Clowney, knew you were going to lose some of the vets to graduation. Don't think that they thought they were losing Charles Bediaco, though, and he's a guy that statistically the numbers don't stand out. But what did I tell you all off season, all, all season long about Alabama? Everybody loves talking about Nate Oates and the three-point shots and the this and the that. I said, but it's the defense that makes them elite. Nobody talked about it, but Betty Yaka was the anchor of that defense. It's going to be really hard to replace him as well. Finally, I would just say this because this segment's going really long. couple names that are, we talk about the, the NBA draft deadline. Remember, there are players that are in the portal right now that could withdraw, and then we could have a new wave of free agency. Julian Phillips from Tennessee, we've talked about. Arthur Kaluma from Creighton, we've talked about. Grant Nelson from North Dakota State, we've talked about. One new name as well. Tyler Burton from Richmond, 19 points per game, seven and a half rebounds per game. This guy is a big athletic dude. I think he is an NBA type talent. And I'm just telling you, this guy comes back to college basketball. When I tell you that every school in America is going to reach out to this guy, he is one of those. Every school in America will be interested in him. Be fascinated to see what he does. He is going to be an impact guy if he comes back to college.